Murphy's dancing. Murphy's got four feet moving to the beat. <laughs> no, he did finally just sit down. Oh, cool. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I think Brent, that should be your opener, Brent, every time. Murphy, sit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. Oh, he just we... heard you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you better tell folks, Brent, who Murphy exactly is. Yeah, Murphy's the new puppy. He's about five months old. Mm. And he's tiny, right? He's like a very small puppy. He's a he's a large golden doodle. Mm. Amazing. Only a about dancing doodle. Yeah. Mm. He's already bigger than most dogs in the neighborhood. So. <laughs> oh, I'm I don't. Trying. I don't. En I don't envy your food bill. <laughs> For him. No, it, it actually dropped significantly when my son left and went to oh. college. <laughs> oh, your son was eating the dog food too. That's really weird, but whatever. <laughs> Puppy chow. It looks like cereal when you put it in the bowl and add water. Yeah, it's all the same. It's yeah. all it's all the same. It's good. Fun to see so many people dropping in. We've got folks from Scotland and yeah. all over the yeah. world hanging out with us today. Good times. It's mm. amazing. Very cool. And Myra, we've also super got, happy to have you back. Yeah, Thank you. We've also got Myra back with us. This is a, a reboot since we tried to do this exact episode um, back in, was that June? And then the, the Crowdcast squirrels got in the way. And then, yeah, it turned out Crowdcast had many squirrels having many problems that day for all of us. So, yeah. yeah. And it looks oh, like well. I'm having bandwidth issues. So, my, my video is going to do this funky thing where it's going to come in and out, I guess. That'll be fun well, it, for today. Well, it's it's good. It, it keeps us all focused. Something, you know, we're we're all working on the email and then the changes and we we come back and pay attention again. So it's like a an it's an impromptu prompt, I guess. It's like wake prompt. up. Are you paying attention, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Okay. That's right. It's, it's, it's um, all planned. It's it's the director is is making mm -hmm. the move. Yeah. Which reminds me, everyone attending today, you need to turn on your screens and share so that we can make sure that you're not watching anything else and watching only us. Yes. Uh, for, for the entire session. That's I think that's the way that we do these things now, right? Yeah. Everybody and, has and you know, to pay attention. Yeah, and the script that I wrote, and of course my ambulances are gonna start, <laughs> right? So I wrote the script. So now when you logged into uh Crowdcast, you know, we put a little bug on your computer and we're gonna track your every movement and gather that data and we're gonna sell it. Well, well, we're, first yeah. we're going to grade. First we're going to grade it. Um, oh, that's you, right. You know, Sorry, yeah. I forgot about the grading. Yeah, yeah. you have to pass uh, with the attention span for a, a period of time <laughs> before we actually give you credit for today's episode. Yes. Our, Alex is asking, "Are pants required?" Um, I do have pants on today. Well, I have leggings on today. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I wore my good jeans today as not opposed required to but recommended <laughs> uh, uh, yeah we, we don't actually have a bell curve for, for for grading pants yet we'll have to figure that out uh, Sunday. so we're going to yeah. talk today a little bit about getting back to basics and helping everybody kind of dial back in and figuring out how we support the business right myra yeah yeah so um you know, we thought this would have been, it was a good topic uh, just because um, I think with the shifts, you know, the pandemic has changed the way we work. It's changed the way we're learning. It's changed our lives in general because I have been, again, in my home in Seattle for, a week. I've only been home for a week and I'm going stir crazy. Um, and so uh, just... I, I really thought that this getting back to basics was important because there's, there's a lot of people that are also shifting careers. Yeah. I have spoken to many uh, people who are tr making this uh, move into instructional design, learning and development. And, and it's so interesting to hear, like, I, I always ask them, like, what, what do you want to work on, right? When, if you're going to make this shift, what do you envision your daily life being like? Um, and then I always recommend, like, 
please talk to other instructional designers, <laughs> find out what their roles are, find out what they're doing on a daily basis. Cause I think people have like this big pie in the sky. Like it's going to be amazing. I'm going <laughs> to influence everything. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like we have this magic wand. Yeah. yeah and then the manager comes to them and says, you know what, can you just pretty up this PowerPoint? Yes. <laughs> yes. And then you become oh completely God. deflated. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, I want to ask everyone though, like as you're joining, let us know where you're dialing in from today, because uh, that keeps it fun for us. And um, I want to know. I'm in Seattle today. Where are you, Brent? I'm in Arizona. Arizona. How about you, Chris? Eastern Ontario. I'm in the rurals, just outside of Ottawa. All right. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and that was the first wake up call right there. Make sure everyone was paying attention <laughs> right. with my video. <laughs> uh, All right. So I see Austin, Houston. We said Cincinnati, right? Um, Ohio. That's my favorite. Narnia. Narnia. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alex, get out of the wardrobe. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously, dude. <laughs> Well, at least you'll find some pants. <laughs> yeah, he'll find some. Oh, look at that. South Africa, guys. Nevada, Atlanta. You know Utah. what, Myra, while they're dropping their yeah. uh, locations in, it, why is it important for people just transitioning into our industry, field, instructional design, whatever part we want to call it? Why is it important for them to work backwards from the business needs? Yeah, so I, this is my favorite topic. So I've been doing uh, workshops. Um, I like to call them LXD sprints. Um, they're design thinking. But it's, and for those I've people that don't know, it. LXD is? Learning experience design. And so I have been, I'm calling them LXD sprints because they're really focused on learning and design and not the whole like idea of like, overarching design thinking, which a lot of people, it's a buzzword, right? But people don't know how to apply it. Yeah. And so um, one of the conversations we have, or, or the first conversation we have is about this, like working backwards from business needs and not just working backwards from like learner needs. And, and it, learner needs are really important, Right. But you don't you can't really figure out what that learner need is until you understand what the business need is. What are the business goals um, for the year, for the quarter? Um, you should be really attuned to those and understand those. Um, ask questions about them. If you don't, you can even ask, like, what are the business goals for 2020 um, or what are our org goals for you know the fourth quarter? Um, once you understand what those goals are, right, then you can start to figure out, okay, so like, let's say there's a goal to, um, I don't know, attain a certain amount of business, right? Whatever it is, like you need to get 200 clients in, in Q4. So working backwards from that, you can identify, okay, so how do we help everyone get to that goal, right? What kind of support can we create from an L and D perspective to support that goal, reaching that goal. And so those are conversations that you have to have and you can't do it in a silo. You can't sit, there's this, you can't have like these business goals and then it's like, oh, we're just gonna do um, compliance training and we're just gonna do um, all this other different training, but we're not gonna do anything that aligns to that business goal, right? Because that's how L and D loses the seat at the table. And so I always talk about getting a seat at the table. Um, you know, I, it has always been something that's been stressed to me. It's like, make sure you have a seat at the table. Make sure, you know, that, and if you don't have a seat, pull one up, right? Um, don't wait for someone to give you a seat. Yeah. It'd be like, excuse me, can I, can I fit in here? Like, you know, and sit down at the table. I'll just take this little corner over here, but I need to be at this table. Um, so you can have those conversations. So I think it's one, and it, it's not only for new um, instructional designers or learning professionals. I, I hate to just do the, the niche instructional designers. I like to think of learning professionals because there's a lot of roles in L&D mm -hmm. and we tend to only address instructional designers, right? So, um, well, let's, let me, let me interrupt yeah. you for one second. Yeah. Just ask, um, so when you say, cause I'm trying to 
put my beginner's mind hat on. So when you say a seat at the table, like which table are you talking about? Like, and are you a manager or are you just an instructional designer? Because it's going to be hard for a brand new instructional designer if you're thinking seat at the table is sitting with the executives at the big round table in the fancy conference room, you know, but it, which table should they be sitting at? Yeah. So um, it de again, so it depends on your role and I'm not going to call them instructional designers. I'm going to call them learning professionals because learning and design has expanded tremendously. So um, I think like if you are not in a position where you have regular interactions with executives in your organization or in your in your business, um, there are smaller orgs within an organization. Like we have the whole hierarchy, right? So um, depending on how your hierarchy is structured, you may um, you may only be meeting with like middle managers. Right. But those middle managers have met with their managers and with their managers. So, you know, goals trickle down. So you should be at least asking your manager for transparency into the goals that are being set at that higher level. And if your manager does not know what those goals are, you need to push your manager to say like, hey, we need to you need to manage up and you need to be like, hey, we should start. We should understand what the goals are so we can uh, add value. Right. So one is learning how to manage up and uh, and manage, you know, vertically also. But managing up is is really important. And so um, you need to ask for the information you need from your man. That's what your manager is there for. Right. So if you can't. So the seat the, when I say get a seat at the table, what I'm saying is like um, there's no real table. Right. And there's no real room. This is just it's it's like our virtual table, virtual room where you're getting the data that you need in order to make informed decisions. Right. And then articulating whatever the plan or strategy is that your team is uh, creating to your manager if you have to. So your manager can articulate it up. Right. Um, again, that's the whole idea of managing up. So we get managed down a lot. You need to start managing up. So did that did they answer your question? Oh, yeah, that was perfect. Yeah, I just okay. you know, just trying to think of, you know, if somebody's joining us for the first time or if one of those folks that's just coming out of, say, education or academia and they want to get into corporate, you know, when we start throwing things out like seat at the table, people might be thinking, ah, like, really where is she going with that but that was perfect yeah cool so yeah so it's not about there's no real seat and that's why i say just take your imaginary seat and pull up to the table take a little corner and you can listen into executive meetings through asking for data right a lot of executive meetings sometimes are broadcast in your organization or they'll put a paper out read that crap because as boring as it may feel you're going to get some really good insights from it when you start looking at it from a different perspective as to like, how can we use this data to inform where we're going to, where we need to set our priorities. Yeah. That sometimes in, in really, really large companies, they'll post the minutes of those mm -hmm. executive meetings. Right. And just the things that they discussed and all that kind of stuff. And you can, you know, like you said, sometimes it can be really super boring or so at such a high level that it doesn't really pertain to you in the work that you're doing but every mm -hmm. once in a while you do get a little nugget you get a little glance into the future and how they're thinking and if you think long enough about it you can see how that trickles down to your particular org and what that might mean to you as a training department and you can kind of head that stuff off yeah and i think that we also need to stop thinking of instructional designers as you're just an instructional designer i'm just an instructional designer this is my little box that I fit in and I can't look outside my box um, because I um, instructional designers have the capacity to um, to influence business right um, and so uh, so someone else is saying I'm reading a comment here for me in higher ed this can be challenging more so than it is when I was in corporate so I work with and so this is great Wendy thank you for sharing that so um, mm -hmm. Part of my job and part of what I do is I straddle two worlds. So I straddle corporate, right? That's my, I, I work at Amazon, but I also straddle public, like my higher education world um, because my clients are higher education institutions that I work with directly. 
And so I understand that for higher in a higher ed setting, there's a lot of red tape. It is ridiculous mm -hmm. the amount of red tape that there is in higher ed. Like I don't understand how they operate. But I think that there's ways around, I don't want to say ways around the red tape, but there are ways to influence and manage and and innovate, right? You just have to be a little bit more calculating and get mm -hmm. um, be able to articulate your innovation, um, uh, be very precise with your words and, and be able to provide a vision of something which may mean writing a document. I do a lot of document writing. So writing mm -hmm. a document to get buy-in. Alex had said earlier in the chats about being not being an order taker, which is often, you know, mm -hmm. there are, oh, we need this and, and then we're expected to deliver it. But um, what I'm hearing you, uh, what I'm hearing you describe is actually uh, being an active seeker of problems in a sense then and finding things that maybe uh, aren't even being identified up here because yeah. their focus is on something that seems obvious, uh, you know, to them, uh, but yeah. being able to, to, find those things. And when you find a problem, if people, other people can recognize it as a problem, then mm -hmm. that starts, that starts the buy-in process and gets the wheels turning. Yeah. And so that's what I do in my, in my workshop, right? So we always start with like a problem statement. What's the problem we're trying to solve? And then we map out a user journey, right? So learner journey to understand like what, how does a learner go from like finding out about the training to completing the training and then what happens after. And it is, for a lot of people, it's painful to go through that process because they open up a lot of problems, right? They identify a lot of issues and it's hard to identify issues. You're not causing them. And I, that's, mm -hmm. sort of, that's one thing that I always have to tell people like, you didn't cause that problem. The problem is systemic, right? And so we're just uncovering some systemic issues Right. And then I make them put it and put them like on this emotional roller coaster journey. And then I ask them, like, how did that make you feel? Just moving, putting yourself in the shoes of your learner. Right. And then um, then we go into like, let's put a positive spin and let's think about some innovative. Let's choose like one or two problems and then let's dwindle it down to one problem. And let's identify some innovative um solutions right regardless of constraints budgets um whatever getting permissions red tape like throw all that out the window and just spitball as many solutions as you can because in doing that you begin to get creative and you may solve a slew of other issues or even solve issues that people did not know existed right yeah. like they, they they're in the system the issues in that system somewhere but um it's not until you start doing this exercise that you start to realize. And I do it for L and D, um, so it's an LXD sprint. But I've done it for larger organizational um, kind of issues, like, um, and it's really interesting how people will say, like, we didn't realize that where we really need to focus in is on X instead of C, right? So mm -hmm. I've been I've been um, in large organizations where we were the ones responsible for, you know, everybody makes it sound so easy. Uh, you guys just do the training on the process, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's a software process or a business physical process or whatever. So you're like, OK, great. Introduce me to the person that knows the process or designed the process mm -hmm. or whatever or is going to use the process. And you start learning. And the more you learn, the more you realize that the process sucks and that it, it, because you're mapping it out and you're following <laughs> it, you're like, it doesn't make any sense. This part doesn't make any sense. So in just investigating and trying to figure it out, all of a sudden you're scratching your head. And next thing you know, you're thinking, I'm actually a process engineer, you know, because a lot of times it's just sometimes that work isn't even done enough to the point where a trainer can even come in and train it because it's just not fully baked yet. And I think people new coming into the industry need to realize that. And that that's where a lot of the difficulty comes in. You're going to be asked to develop training for stuff that really isn't even completely done. And that's hard. Yeah. I also think that um, instructional designers get dumped on a lot. Right. Um, so yeah, you're asked to like, here, can you fix this PowerPoint? Or we need this e-learning for this specific thing. 
and I think the issue comes in is when instructional designers don't ask questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Like why, like why, what's the goal? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) What's the goal of this? What is the outcome that you're looking for? What is the behavior that you're looking like? What is like just being able to ask questions when you're given a project or task and, and then offering solutions. And I think a lot of it is fear of retribution, right? where people are afraid to speak up. And I see that not only in instructional design, I see that all over the place. And I have a big mouth. So I always question people and I'm like, well, why are you doing it that way, right? Like, and why, this is dumb. Like, why are you wasting time and money doing this? And, you know, so um, I think it's about uh, speaking up and also, but also not just being, this is this is crap, but more like, Okay, so have you considered other, can we consider other solutions? Are, are you open to considering other solutions? I have these ideas. Can we explore them, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, asking for, yeah. Pull back on that. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was just gonna say a couple of awesome uh, comments being thrown in. Uh, Wendy's uh, noting, so glad this is a topic this week. I'm co-leading a project to revise our orientation and onboarding, working backwards from the, the need is key. Um, and then Die Hard threw in literally my life right now as I've, I've been assigned to develop material for a totally different area of business. My first words were, I'm approaching this as a new hire would. So if I can't make sense of it, expect your new hires not to and give me the resources or subject matter experts I need if and when I need them, um, which is a thing that, that's a, a perspective shift, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's saying I'm not just simply doing I can't just simply do this thing based on your assumptions that that, that, it, that it's already you know baked, et cetera. We're gonna find we're gonna find problems to solve along the way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And so I like um Kim says, yes, questions. Mm-hmm. What does success look like? Right. And you, that's a good question. Um yeah. you know, I like to ask um like what are what do you what is the outcome of this? Like what is our end our end game, right? What's the end game for this? Um, because mm-hmm. I think I think sometimes we need to speak in in plain language also and people um like I, I like to write at a sixth grade level, you know, seventh, sixth grade level for people because we have so much information thrown at us that we need to keep things simple. And so just yeah. asking someone like, what's the end goal with this? Like, you know, I think you you trigger them and they're like, mm-hmm. oh, wait, we have an end goal or an end game. OK, so, yeah, this is the end game. Right. Like and so. Right. And that end game needs to also be, uh, you know, tied back to what is the business's goals, not just the particular, you know, thing that we're trying to solve, but how does this then tie into, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the stated objectives, like you said, for this quarter or, or for the, for the, you know, the upcoming year, et cetera, too, which yeah. sometimes it's not, yeah. sometimes, you know, we're, we're thrown into fixing things or helping to solve things that have come up, which are, um, you know, oh gosh, everyone needs training, um, uh, immediately for, um, you know, for COVID, uh, for working back in the office, just speaking from Domino's own perspective, as we're starting to look at reopening, you know, the office for people to work in. But there's that, so there's the, the, the meeting of the need to actually make sure that everyone is trained so that we have all of the checks in the boxes from, from a, a, a compliance perspective, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also having to make sure that, you know, what, what's that, what's the success going to look actually look like beyond that, um, uh, that that people are going to feel comfortable and safe as part of this, not just following uh, you know the rules. You want to make sure that that because that contributes to the business goals of people being successful and and productive, et cetera, not merely just ticking the boxes, for example. Yeah, and so we know that compliance training is never going away. It's an important <laughs> part of business, right? But I think that also with like we have some extra set of challenges right now, and so I would just like to get a, a survey of of. Uh, just in the chat, if you can just post in the chat, um, what do you think are your biggest challenges right now when it comes to learning and development? I would say while while people are dropping that in too, I'll just add this in. Sometimes there's a secondary uh, hidden agenda that is actually the primary agenda. And one of my favorites is always when, can you build this training and can we have it? Like, you know, in 14 days and there's, you know, you can either say, well, no, or yes, or whatever, but oftentimes pushing with a few questions, you'll get to an answer that is, well, 
be like, you know, this is kind of extreme, but um, you know, my job is on the line. If we, if, if I don't have this, if our team doesn't have this done, I get dinged at my review or something like that. Sometimes there's other issues driving a panicked need that gets tossed at the training team and the instructional designers. And, and at that point, and in those situations, obviously it depends on the, the internal politics, but sometimes you, you, your job then just ends up being to make your manager look good, do whatever you can to protect your manager, you know, cause a, a lot of times it is, it's just, it's everyone's jockeying for position and it, you know, if you're brand new, you have to understand that those games are being played at those levels and you don't want them to be, but they are, it's just reality inside of the corporate space. So, you know, the people you support, they don't forget that when you yeah. made them shine mm -hmm. and made them look good, that's, that's, it's critical. Yeah, it is. Right. And I think that, um, the asking questions can help you to dig deeper into, uh, to uncover some of those secondary agendas. Um, so I just want to look here at some of the answers. So we have uh, some of the challenges are lack, lack of funding. I think that's a challenge all over the place because L&D gets deprioritized, right? Because we're not aligning to the business and we're just seen as a capital expense. Um, uh, some seem to have perspective that online is temporary. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, not, just that, not just using e-learning to tick a box. Um, lack of funding, we said, uh, getting time with SMEs, company, getting company to understand development lines. Okay, so these are all good, right? And and there's like a theme in here. So common. These are yeah. very common problems. Yeah. And so um, culture doesn't appreciate training interventions. So I think there's other underlying issues under a lot of these issues that we're raising, right? Because we're looking at it from a learning and development perspective, and we're not looking at it from a business perspective also. Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, I come from a culture where you write a paper for everything. You have formal document reads. Um, you will have executives in your document reads, whether it's a director or a VP, um, read your document. Um, along with the other groups of people and provide you feedback on your document. And the purpose of your document is to, you're either um, uncovering an area of pain and providing a solution, a potential solution, right? You are mapping out a strategic plan. Um, you are thinking big and innovating, right? Just something new and different and um but being able to articulate how, what the ROI is gonna be on that, what kind of data and metrics will you be able to collect? Um, and so this idea of taking that step back and thinking about things thoroughly and gathering data to support your, your, mm -hmm. your, your position, helps you to create develop credibility and earn trust, right? And so Amazon, we have leadership principles that we uh, are, guiding principles for everything. Um, we measure each other by it. We measure our projects by it, uh, our work by everything. We, it's like ingrained in our language. And so um, you need to earn trust, right? With your leadership, with your customers um, before you can begin to innovate. And you can earn trust by clearly articulating what your ideas are. And not just going into a room saying, we, I think we need to do this because like, you know, um, it's the new trend in whatever field and that doesn't help build credibility. Like you need to take time to step back and say like, okay, what are the issues that we're facing right now with LNT? Maybe you do have this culture that doesn't appreciate le the learning interve interventions. Um, so why is that? Take a step back and look at your process for that learning intervention. How painful is it for the for the learners, right? Mm -hmm. um, how time consuming is it? Like have, sit through that whole journey yourself, right? Um, to then uncover what are, what are the issues like, and then think about how can you drive adoption, right? And articulate that, like put it in writing. We create an, uh, I like to call this service of process SOPs. I write a lot of SOPs too. They're like, we're gonna do X, and here's how it's going to work. And then at the outcome, this is how we're going to maintain it. And then, you know, this is like what the metric is that we're going to measure. 
Yeah. I mean, Taisha is outlining, you know, uh, the culture doesn't appreciate training interventions and on the job application, they prefer PowerPoint instructor led training with no 360 follow up. So, and that's a common thing that many of us inherit things uh, or we're put into a place where the, the company culture has always done something. And it's, it's a, it's a challenge when you're either, you know, new or not a, in a sphere of influence to, to make those cultural changes. But maybe, uh, as, as Myra's pointed out, asking questions. Um, hey, do we know how people do after a, you know six months? Do we have any info on that or to show that what we did before you know, was helpful, et cetera? And, and maybe those questions can then lead to people opening up a conversation anyway about um, maybe doing something that's different or, or adding on things at least to something that, that currently exists. And I'm going to recommend two books. I'm trying to look them up right now. I'm going to put them in the chat. So there are two books that I recommend because it's all good to like talk about, you know, all this stuff like in theory, like, you know, like historical and background. And, um, but I think that uh, I'm a, I'm an avid reader guy. So I consume books uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know like people drink soda or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I, I read about three books a week. I, and I always have like two or three books going at a time. Um, and that's how I just like um, operate, right? I think it's just, I'm not saying that you need to read all of these books and, you know, but I'm going to throw a link in here. Um, so the first book is Design Sprints and it's uh, written by guys at Google. Um, so this is what I base a lot of my LXD sprints off of this combination of design thinking and design sprints that has its roots in design thinking also to help you uncover issues and, and innovate right very quickly. So um, this is like five day sprints where you can um, really start thinking differently. So uh, did that link work, Brent or Chris? Can you just check? I, I can see sure. it. Okay, good. I can see it there. Yeah. Click on it and see if it actually launches something. Yep. It no. It, yeah. It just okay. So um, you can get the Kindle book, audio book, whatever works for you. And then the other book I'm gonna recommend is uh, Range. This is one of my favorite books um, because it talks about. Um, you know, I think in L and D, we always think like, you know, um, we need to specialize in, in, in one thing. And I believe in being a generalist, right? And so you can't say, uh, here, I'm going to put the title into just in case. Um, so saying like, I only do L and D, right? And I don't do anything else is, is not beneficial to your career. So you also need, when you're working, you need to think about your career and where you want to go. I, mm -hmm. I've listened to that in audiobook format, and I will second that recommendation. That's a great, great read. Yeah, right. I, yeah, I love I, my favorite story is the um, one where they go into uh, this remote community where they present them with a problem and they, they see the problem very differently uh, because of the culture, which is like crazy, right? Because you're like, oh, that's so interesting, yeah. you know? Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's such a good book. Range is a really good book. I, I love design sprints. I've read that like 10 times. I actually, it's my Bible, right? <laughs> the thing I love about that is I, um, it's, it gives a framework for focus, right? And I, mm -hmm. I think in a lot of corporate, and maybe I'm just dating myself. I just, I'm, so everybody, I, I'm hearkening back to my corporate days of, of living in a cubicle farm and doing all of that kind of stuff. So I have experienced all this stuff firsthand and I have all the scars from it left over. But you, it was hard to find time to focus on projects sometimes. You'd always be pulled into meetings. You'd always be pulled into something else. It's always whatever the fire of the day was. And this is how training departments always had this bad rap for just being order takers. I used to call us the fire department because, you know, we were the, we were the very last ones. Like all the other businesses were super important until they screwed up. Then it's bring in training. So we're like, we're like <laughs> the first responders of corporate screw ups. And um, what I love about when design sprints first came out, to have a framework like that, that you can hand and that upper management, middle management, your manager appreciates is basically a framework to say, 
we're not going to mess with you for five days because you've got this sprint that you're focused mm-hmm. on. And there's a, there's a strategy and a framework. And for five days, we're just going to jam on this one problem. And for somebody like me, that is gold to have people out of your hair and not messing with you because they know, Hey, they're doing, they're in a, they're in a sprint. We can't bother them. You know, that, that to me is, that was everything when those, that was first created, whoever did it, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So it's the, the guys at Google, you know, um, I, I will give genius credit where genius credit goes and, you Mm -hmm. know, to be able to articulate, um, and pages in black and white paper and put a framework together is that's a hard thing to do right Mm -hmm. um and so uh i think it's it's really interesting and so i'm gonna i have one more book i'm gonna recommend is ray dalio's principles i'm trying to get a link for you guys um so he is actually an entrepreneur and he shares um some of his um uh techniques for getting alignment, getting buy-in. These are really long links. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm just copying the link at the top of the Amazon. I, it's too early for me. I can't find the share button. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Talk to your folks at Amazon and tell them to shorten yeah. these darn links. <laughs> yeah, I know. I need to start doing that. So this is Ray Dalio's principles. And so um, it really talks about like wh- how to get the right people well, um, in um, your conversations. And so one of the things with design sprinting, right, and that works really good with principles is that when you're design sprinting, and this is something we do also on my team, is you have to bring in um, other representatives from other parts of the business. So in a, de- in a good design sprint, you are bringing in someone from finance, from HR, from marketing, um, from IT, Um, from any of the other departments, you have legal and you're bringing them into this uh, planning session. Like, you you know, you don't have to call it design sprint, but you're bringing them into this planning session to get those diverse perspectives, right? Because they're seeing things from a different perspective. And the moment you start collaborating and bringing those people into your conversation, you are starting to earn trust and build uh, this, Mm -hmm. this network for yourself where you can then become um, a subject matter expert for like learning and development where they, they will look to you and say, like, let's, let's try, like we did this cool thing with, with, you know, uh, with Brent and it was really effective because the product at the end was like this, this really good um, thing that, you know, came out at the end. We should do that again. Right. So you can then de- start to change yeah. the culture. Um, so if you're, if you're in a culture where you're like, oh, the culture doesn't appreciate this, bring other people into the game. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Mar- Martha had a question. Uh, once you've got a good grasp on business needs, working backwards from there, what factors influence the solutions um, you recommend? And one of the things that came to my mind was, was um, Kathy Moore's action mapping plan approach. And I'll just paste in a link there. Um, she has a very clear structure for having, and it includes a, a, you know, having the conversation of moving away from knowledge dump to focusing on, um, on skills and, and producing results based on business needs, et cetera, um, compared to, you know, the typical, Hey, here's everything we need to know. Can you make a training course out of it? Um, and it's, a uh, anyway, it's a, it's a, a, a link that I keep handy. I probably go to it twice a year just to refresh, uh, and, and uh, you know, get get a little bit of extra juice out of it every once in a while too. Yeah, I agree. And like, um, and and again, it's not a one size fits all either, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. so it's gonna be very different depending on your project. And so don't think, you know, having a framework to work off of. I'm gonna tell you, you need to be okay with um, <laughs> it not being the same every single time. Yeah. Right. Like yep. be be flexible um, because the results you're going to get are very different um, and you may have to take a different approach. A framework is meant to be referenced. <laughs> it is not like meant to be followed to the T. <laughs> <laughs> it's guideposts. It's it's pathways as opposed to um, as, as opposed to, you know, a constant rails or something like that. Yep. Mm. Very cool. Uh, it's the bumpers in the gutters of the bowling alley that 
keep the ball down the lane, no matter how bad <laughs> you are. Yep, I uh. agree. <laughs> I think we're getting philosophical now. That was a bad analogy. <laughs> it, was a, a it was close, Brent. It was close. You're you're good. <laughs> my, my my brain went to the Big Lebowski there, and I'm having trouble coming back. From yeah, it, I was so. gonna say, does anybody even bowl anymore? I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, keep it keep it between oh, the lanes, guys. Keep it in the lanes. <laughs> well, well we're probably reaching about that time where we have to wrap it up what are what are some final things i mean you've nailed some really great basics myra but if you just maybe if you had to recap or if you had to just explain to somebody how to focus or just leave them with a nugget that's going to be something they can take away extra what would you tell them yeah so i would say uh, i always tell people be take risks be daring um ask questions right um, ask a lot of questions be a good listener so mm. ask learn be able to ask questions but also be able to listen and not just listen for the answers you are looking for so beautiful yep 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 that's how you that's how you discover things that uh, that nobody knew about yet problems that we don't know so yeah I love um yeah Probably a good time to dance on out of here for this week. Yeah, this was fun, guys. Yes, Thank you so much. And, and hey, Crowdcast worked this time. Yay! No technical problems. Woohoo! Excellent. I hope Thanks everyone has a great day. Yeah, yeah, don't put us on your calendars, everybody, and uh, join us next week. We're going to have a great guest next week as well. So we're going to, things are just rocking along for us. So I hope it is for everybody else too. I hope you guys are mm -hmm. all. Uh, Staying safe and yeah. uh, distancing and all that good stuff, wearing your mask. And in the meantime, have a cup of coffee, enjoy your day, and hang out with all your peeps. Thanks again, Myra. Bye, guys. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Have a great week, folks. See you next time. And Chris, this means you get to do the Zoom. Mm. <laughs> the ring light effect. Yeah. Adios, everybody. Bye.